curiosity, uh, put in the chat if you wouldn't mind, um, how many of you are finding that you're struggling to either retain, re recruit good talent and or retain good talent right now? If you're, if you're struggling, put, go ahead and put in the chat for me so I know who I'm talking to here. And, and if you're not and, and you're not struggling, then, you know, what is it? Let's, let's talk about that. I really, if you're not struggling, let me know because I really would like to know. Uh, Ron, just for the last 33 years. Yes, Ron, but I read that you, you hit your goal, your, built your, uh, your gross receipts goal for the month. So congratulations. Uh, Ken Shepard is struggling on the phones. Got it. Uh, Jim has been struggling. Emily is getting there, but we've had challenges for sure. Good. Um, so we're going to talk a little bit about this. Yeah, Emily, congratulations. You just got a couple of new hires and you're onboarding them well. And we talked a little bit about that. Um, Luke, you lost a talented attorney in my office and decided to replace it with a paralegal instead. Okay, good. We'll talk about that. Indy's struggling with uh, that process. Got it. Zoe, getting ready to hire new talent. All right, Zoe, good. Um, so we're going we're gonna to talk uh, about this globally, and then we're going to talk about some tactics. Um, and so one thing is to, to set the stage for us, and I don't have a presentation, so I, I have my notes here. I have, I have an, like an outline and Somebody wants me to share that with them, I can, but I don't have like a PowerPoint uh, slide deck because it's just me and you having a conversation. Um, if you're, by the way, if you're new here, if you're a guest around here and you're like, wow, this guy's strange, uh, it's July. And normally I take the month of July off. Uh, every, every year I take the month of July off. And I, this is like, July is no different. I always show up for interview with an expert. I usually do an open uh, Q&A uh, and I field some questions and I just go about answering them. Uh, Blaine Elkers, our chief results officer, brought it to my attention that this year, the big topic that I really needed to address was, was hiring and, and really addressing this process. And he thought maybe we could have a panel of some sort. But, you know, I, I went out and I had a great conversation with a lot of folks that are doing this well. And, uh, and I've got my own experiences. And so I just thought we would cover some of the basics and then dive deeper when anybody has a conversation that they want to open it up. Uh, Talia is... Um, uh, both employees gave me their two weeks last week. Help. Yeah. Talia, sorry about that. Um, you're not the first person that I heard that from. Um, so we're going to, we're going to talk about why. And again, if you're new around here and I reference partners club or I reference the dashboard or something, yeah, there's a membership involved. And so if you want more information about that, you can always email us richard at the richardjames.com and we can talk about it. But for today, let's see if I can give you some real value and help you get through this crisis we're going through in what we consider the great resignation. So I heard a great uh, story uh, just today, actually, as I was preparing to put up the final touches on this, I was listening to a podcast. Uh, and the, they said that Warren Buffett, when he sought out his mentor, I don't know if you know this, but his mentor is a guy by the name of Benjamin Graham. He, he had this idea of a, what he called the cigar butt theory, which is that there's still a couple of good uh, smokes in a cigar butt. If you were in New York City and you were a bum and some, some wealthy guy threw a cigar butt on the ground, the bums would look for cigar butts and get a couple of good last drags out of them. And that's how they got to smoke their cigars uh, without paying for them. Um, and Benjamin Graham had this idea that there were stocks that people discarded uh, that really still had a few good drags out of them. And so they, they put together a formula of finding those stocks. That's really how, uh, you know, Warren Buffett got started finding these stocks that Benjamin Graham kind of laid out that formula for him. And they would buy these stocks and, and, and eek, some eek, some profit out of them. And then they would flip them over and turn them. And then, as many of you know, Warren Buffett then went on to devise his own program of saying, you know what, I'm going to find these stocks, but I'm going to find them the ones that can actually have a great future and I'm, I'm going to buy them um, and I'm not going to let them go. I'm going to keep them. So he still holds most of the stock that he bought way back when. Uh, and it's part of Berkshire Hathaway's success story. So he found really great companies with great fundamentals. That's really not the point of the story though. The point of the story is he went and asked uh, Graham for a job and he said, look, at I, you, you have so much to offer I would love to work for you and I'll do it for free. And Graham looked at Warren Buffett and said, well, son, unfortunately, you'd be grossly overpaid at that rate. And the point is that Benjamin Graham was suggesting that not only should you not work for me for free, you should be paying me for this information because I'm going to change your life. And so the folks that come and work for you, depending on the role, uh, but based on the things that you know, 
you're likely going to help them master their career in that particular role, whether it be a, a phone person all the way to a senior associate, and you're going to work with them to become a better version of themselves. And you have an awful lot of knowledge in growing and managing a small business now because you've been in our world and you have an awful lot of knowledge of being a great attorney serving your clients. And so you have a lot to offer these folks besides just a paycheck. Now, that's not often enough, but it's really important that you recognize that your job as a, uh, as a recruiter and somebody who keeps your team, your job is to remind them of this. I've told this story before. It's worth telling again. Um, I, I had a mentor back in the mm, late 90s, early 2000s, uh, and he owned florists. He was the fifth largest florist. He owns. He owned, he owned. The, well, he was the fifth largest florist in the country. That's the right way to say it, uh, by gross revenues. And so uh, he was my mentor. And when I first met him, he really owned a couple florists, and uh, we were, you know, pretty good friends because I was in the funeral business, and I wanted to spread the wealth around. So I not only gave the business to him, but because we were in the funeral business and we knew a lot of florists, I gave, you know, I gave him like the, the wedding aisle and the, and the altar. And I gave another florist all of the fine boutonniere work. And I gave another florist like the reception hall. And none of them were really happy that I did it that way, but they were all understood and they did it. Anyway, suffice it to say, Brian McCarthy showed up at the wedding to do the all get all the final preparations for the, you know, the, the aisle and the altar together, make sure everything was right. And there he was in the back of the church, realizing that the, the firm that dropped off the boutonnieres just dropped them off in the back of the church and let them go. And Brian McCarthy um, proceeded to take the other company's boutonnieres and put them on all my groomsmen. And when he saw me later that day at my wedding, he told me that story. And if I were to see, this was 27 years ago. If I were to see Brian McCarthy today, anywhere, he would remind me of that story again. And the reason I tell you this is because Brian McCarthy taught me one thing, many things, but one of the things that he taught me was never, ever, ever forget to remind your team what it is that you do for them. Never, ever, ever forget to remind your clients what it is you do for them, your vendors, fill in the blank, whoever you work with, when you're a good company to work with and you do a good job at providing them a foundation and you have a good working relationship with them, don't assume that they know it. So I, I'm telling you all this because I don't know that this is the foundational principle that many of small business owners that happen on law firms come from. I think that they think about it, well, I'm putting an ad out and people want a job and so they'll retain my firm or they'll come to work for my firm and in turn, you know, in turn, I'm going to give them a paycheck. Now let's talk about th this idea of why people are quitting. So how many people feel they've had people quit on them because of the great resignation? Put it, put in there if you would, I have, I do, me, whatever, just give me something. So I know I'm, I'm not talking to the dead air here. Remember when I'm not interviewing and I'm lecturing, you know, can feel like I'm talking into an oven. Um, okay, so you believe you've had people quit because of the great resignation. Now, how many people feel that you've had people leave your employee because of normal life situations? Somebody decides they don't want to be in that industry anymore. They jump to another world. They move. They, whatever they do, they just, they don't want to do that. Yeah, okay, normal situation. It's great. Okay, tough one. How many people believe that they've had people quit their team because of less than stellar leadership? This is a tough one. You don't have to answer if you don't want out loud. Meaning we didn't have a great onboarding process. Uh, so in other words, when they joined the team, it was, you know, 
mismatches to the way to the way they got onboarded, where the paperwork is going to be done, who was going to be the person they were going to go to, how who were they going to talk to, what what desk they were going to sit at, what was their did they have all the equipment and their phones were set up right, where all the usernames and passwords already created, did they get a little box welcoming them to the team, did they did we introduce them to everybody, walk around, shake their hands, and make sure they felt part of the family, you know, an onboarding process, a real system for onboarding, micromanaging the new employee experience, right, lousy onboarding maybe that we weren't congruent. We, 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 we sold them on how, you know, what this company was like, but when they arrived, the, the way that everybody acted around them and, or the way that they experienced things wasn't the way they were pitched the dream. Maybe that goes with the lack of onboarding. Maybe we undercompensated them because we thought we could get away with it. And maybe they're getting paid less than somebody else in the firm. Um, worse, maybe they were getting paid more than somebody else in the firm at the same job and that front person because they negotiated better and we lost the other person. Um, maybe, maybe there's a lack of mentorship. Either we were supposed to mentor them or somebody else on the team was supposed to mentor them and leadership didn't check in to make sure mentorship was happening. Um, may, maybe there was no clear systems to run. Like, they didn't know exactly what they were supposed to do or how they were supposed to do it or how the systems ran. There was no real operation manual or anything for them to turn to. You know, from their perspective, they would feel like they were hired to just jump in and figure it out and throw a uniform on them. And while that works, sometimes that's not what they feel like they were sold. Maybe there's a lack of training. So ongoing training, like they feel that they like what they do and they're paid a market-based wage, but there's no ongoing training for them to get better at their job and continue to grow and maybe grow within the company or just grow within their job so they can continue to be a better uh, productive team member. Maybe there's a toxic environment, right? So maybe maybe there's you know Sally or Bob in the company that's cancerous and and the leadership is letting it go and you drop a new person in and they're immediately poisoned by this cancerous individual. If anybody's had cancer, I don't mean to you know use that word lightly. I get it; it's a big deal, and so I hope that nobody took offense by it. But my my point is that you know sometimes leadership is not quick on the uptake on getting rid of those folks that we need to purge the company of. But, but maybe one of the reasons why we don't purge the company of it is because we don't have really, really clear core values. And, and we don't have, we don't, we don't have a, a, a clear way of articulating what we're about around here. And, and, we, and, and if we do, it's, it's kind of like a mission statement that's written on, the, on a piece of paper that's shoved away into a file somewhere. And, and it's not lived. It's not breathed. We don't talk about it. We don't hire to it. We don't fire to it. It's not part of our culture. And and so, you know, do we forget about our core values, even if we have, even if we do have them, do we forget about them? And, and did the people that came in also forget about them? And consequently, they, they left them behind. And so, I, I, look, I'm not picking on anybody. I'm absolutely guilty of every one of these things, 100%. And, and, and more, by the way, um, I, I, you know, one of the things I'll tell you, and we'll talk about this, is, is getting with the times. I, I, it took me a long time to get with the times. Um, remember, I, you know, my way of, I was taught, if you, if you all forget, I was taught how to manage, you know, when my, this story has been told before, but it's worth telling, you know, the way I thought you managed employees and vendors and everybody else was, was that, you know, you, you were going to be uh, at your seat, you know, at 845. And if you were there at nine o'clock on time, on time was late and the doors to a meeting gets locked. And if you, if you're late to a meeting and whether you're, 25 or you're 58 with a cane, you got to get down on the floor to do push-ups to get in the door. I mean, this is how I ran my life and how I ran my meetings. And people, everybody knew who I was, but I had a lot of turnover. I mean, I had a lot of turnover. Um, and I, I just thought it was, well, you know, I'm here to repel them and that's fine. And may, maybe I can get away with that when hiring was a little bit looser, but when hiring is tighter like this, boy, oh boy, we got we to try to figure out how to hang on to people. So I guess, I guess what I'm saying to you is, the great resignation isn't the only reason why we're losing people right now. It's one of them. And the lack of uh, great talent available to us is, a, is another one that uh, causes a loss of any new ta existing talent to hurt more because it's harder for us to go find somebody. It costs us more money to find somebody. And so, but, but I don't, you know, I'm not being political, but we all know that there were some things that were brushed under the COVID blanket uh, and called it COVID, but it wasn't really COVID, like, you know, some illnesses or deaths. And, and again, that's not me getting political. That's just me stating a fact. We, we know some of these things happened. And so I don't want to brush our issues with hiring and recruiting under the great resignation blanket. I'm not denying that it's happening. It is definitely happening. I hear it 
all the time, not only from you, but all my friends, I, you know, my buddies that own businesses that play, that I play golf with, we, we hear it all the time. You know, this gal was making $60,000 a year from me and they were what we would consider at the top of the market scale. And they left us to go take a $120,000 job doing the exact same thing for another company working virtually from home. It's like, oh my goodness, anybody else have that happen? You can raise your hand or say, I have, I mean, that that's like, are you kidding me? Like, what, how do we compete with that? No, the answer is we don't, you know, the answer is we don't, it makes it, it makes it hap It makes it hard. Um, but so what we have to ask ourselves is that aside, are we doing everything else we can control? We can't control their life situations. We, we can't control the great resignation, but what we control is making sure we have a fantastic setup in place to to not only recruit, but also to uh, fish. Well, we're gonna talk about hunting and fishing and, and as well as retain excellent staff. Now, I've been fortunate. Um, uh, I let go of some team members in the la at the end of last quarter, uh, last year, sorry, end of 2021, uh, because I changed my marketing style around and there were some team members I didn't need anymore. Um, but other than that, I mean, we've had, we've had team members stay with us for a very long time. And, and I don't think it's because I overpay. I don't suggest that I underpay. I believe we pay what's considered a market-based wage. And I believe I'm fair with everybody, but it's, it's not because of compensation that they're sticking around or not sticking around. I, I believe they're sticking around because we've started to get a lot of these things right. Um, have I had guys and gals leave us because they were made an offer at a rate that I just couldn't compete with. Yeah. Happened to me twice, two superstars. I had, uh, they just got recruited. One taught himself how to program and went from, you know, being a $50,000 type of employee level to, you know, because he could program in JavaScript and won a hacking competition to make $300,000 a year. And that's what he got paid. Uh, another guy was just a seasoned entrepreneur and, and got a real opportunity to, to, to take his experience and knowledge and grow another company that was already a $100 million company and get paid a share of the profits on it. And I just couldn't compete with that. And he's making three times what he made with me and maybe more now. And, uh, and he did basically the same thing for them that he was doing for me. I just didn't have a big enough ship for him to succeed in. And so sometimes that stuff happens. Um, but all these other things are, are things that we can control. So, um, Let's see what we got here. I'm going to pull up my, my participants window here and see what I've got. So, so let's just have a chat because I don't want this just to be me. So David, I don't know if you're, David, I saw your post on the queue. Are you with me, David? Are you in a place? Are you just listening or can you actually talk? David Lear. Let me see. Is his camera on? No, his camera's not on. So he might be. No, his camera's not on. I asked to unmute, be. but. Nothing he may yet. he may be he may be like listening from the courtroom or something. So, all right, Jim, you're there. You're front and center for me. What challenges are you having staffing right now? What's the biggest challenge you're having? I think uh, our biggest challenge is retention. Um, you know, we've had some unexpected turnover, um, and uh, you know, some of it has been people moving on to probably better you know better paying jobs. Um, where, you know, as you give the example, we really can't compete with, you know, what they're, what they're going to make at a new job. Um, and so we've had some of that and then just, you know, in terms of trying to hire quality people to replace the openings we have. So, um, it's been a challenge. What's weird is we went through COVID and it lose an employee yeah. during 2020 into the first half of 2021 and then the second half of 2021 is when it started are you and, losing and them to law firms or other industries both both yeah, yeah. Okay. although so, the money is typically other industries yeah the, the money issue is usually another industry where they're making a significant jump in salary Okay, good. That's, that's helpful. Thank you for sharing that. I, uh, you know, that'll help me with the conversation. So we're going to be talking about for you in that recruiting world, 
Michael Packard, how about you? What are, what are you finding as a challenge? Maybe you're not finding a challenge. I know you're just next on my screen. You got anything going on specifically? Yeah, it's, I mean, similar stuff. Uh, we, we did have a bit of turnover during COVID. Um, just the people with the family situation that they couldn't work remotely. You got kids and dogs and homeschooling and all that stuff. And so, uh, and then um, the problem has seemed to just kind of continue. We'd hire people, we do great interviews, and then it comes time to start and they just wouldn't show up. Right. They just ghost you, right? They're like, Baffling, yeah. Um, great employees that we had. Somebody got really got offered twice of what they were getting paid here. Uh, like, wow, you got to take that job. One of our best employees, or that really happy for her in a sad sort of way. Um, and so we're just kind of going through interviews and trying to, I, I don't know, we, we're, we're trying to hire some, a couple of people to fill uh, vacancies that are having a hard time getting filled uh, with the way that we were doing it before. And I, I'm tempted to just say, okay, we'll just pay more, but I don't think that's the right thing, but maybe it is, I don't know. Well, we're going to talk about that. So, so like, let's, let's talk about that. Um, you know, possibly paying more, you know, so where does that game end? And when you pay them a lot more, what happens when the other employees in your team find out that they're being paid more and you create this environment where now all of a sudden you've got to keep upping this game and your margins are fixed, especially in a contingency based firm, like you are, you can't raise prices. So, you know, you're, what basically happens is the firm gets, it becomes less profitable. And, and even if this is a temporary problem, so we're in a temporary environment of hiring like we are, now you've created this environment where you've got one or two people in your company that are earning more than everybody else. And at some point, everybody's going to figure it out. It's likely they're not going to quit. Everybody else is either going to quit or ask for a raise, right? So yeah, they threaten to quit, move on, and then, you know, let's do what Sally did and get a, a raise. Right. And, and I, I mean, I, I uh, to, to clarify more for me is more than market-based wage. Right. So, right. Uh, and so, yeah, I don't, I don't know that I agree with it. We got to figure out um, how we're going to talk about it, but like, let me ask when you're looking for somebody, how important is it for you to find somebody with experience? Um, it's, it's not important. It's some, sometimes it's a negative. Got it. So you can hire somebody that doesn't have a lot of experience, right? Right. Okay, great. Good. We're going to talk about that. I'm going to make a note here for myself. Um, yeah, what Joe said, exactly. You got to untrain them and then you end up spending more to untrain them. Yeah, there, there, there is some real truth to that, right? Let's see. Did, was that a Joeism? Yeah, I tried by experience, ended up overpaying for bad habits, moving on to back training people. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm with you. I'm with you 100%. Uh, Joe, I think that... Um, that has been my experience too. So like, um, let me give you the juxtaposition of that. So like Sherry is a great example. Okay. So Sherry's not an employee. She's a contractor, but does it matter? She's doing a job for me. Contractor just determines how she's paid. She's can make her own schedule. And I, I let my staff make all their own schedules, but we'll, we'll talk about that too. But, um, but Sherry was hired for a very specific reason with a very specific skill set. So I went out and searched for her, found her as a recommendation and recruited her. Now I only get her on a limited basis. I, I can't afford her full time for lots of reasons and nor would she want to do it full time because she has a business to run. But the amount of time that she does allow me to have uh, uh, fills the need that we have. So she's a very highly skilled individual at her role. And, and so she was able to fill that. And then by the way, while we found out she was highly skilled in that role, um, luckily for us, I was able to negotiate a, a, a little bit more of her time to bridge that what she was skilled in that role over to another role. So I was able to get her to help us in the chief inspection officer role. And so she, now she fills kind of two primary roles with us. Neither one of them are full-time positions per se, but, but I bet you, I bet you a dollar to a donut, as my grandfather used to say, I bet you that if I went out to fill Sherry's role as the event planner for our company, and like it was going to be an event plan, I bet I would find somebody who would expect it to be a full-time job and they would take 40 hours a week to do the same thing that Sherry does in whatever, five hours or 10 hours. I don't know how many hours a week that Sherry works. I, I never asked her, so I'm not going to, I'm not going to ask, but, but you know, I, what I'm suggesting is, is I know, and the reason I know this is I had somebody that I was paying, you know, 30 hours a week of labor for, uh, to do the job, not as well as, and, and, and to do it not as efficiently as, 
uh, as Sherry's doing. So there is a place for recruiting good talent, but I often find that place is some sort of like uh, temporary part-time hiring, um, uh, a really, really skilled individual at a higher rate. I, I think of the law clerks. I think of subbing out work to really experienced attorneys who are going to be our inspectors on different cases as the cases go under their nose. They can make sure all the I's are dotted and T's are crossed. We're going to pay a high dollar per hour for that fee, but we're going to get a job done that paying, having somebody else full-time in the office wouldn't make sense to do. David, I saw that you were... Uh... <laughs> I sure. <laughs> I see your comments. Sorry. Uh, she's a unicorn. Got it. Um, with sparkles. With sparkles. There you go. So, David, you see you're here. Uh, so what's going on? I know you, you were struggling with some hiring issues and then you had somebody else resign and you asked a question about how long they're sticking around. Where are you at right now? Well, the first guy went to the DA's office. I'm a criminal defense lawyer, so he just flipped sides. So uh, that was that. I actually. Replaced- Why do you think he flipped sides? Pay or... Uh, it's a combination of pay, and I think he found distasteful a couple of the tasks that defense attorneys have to do. Got it. Um, you're either one or the other, kind of. I, I replaced him with a guy with five times the legal experience that he has, so we'll see if that... I don't think I need to retrain the lawyer the same way I would need to retrain a, a staff person necessarily. So, yeah, no. so I think that so I think that answer depends. And, and this is one of those practice areas specific, like bankruptcy. Um, you know, I probably don't need a highly experienced trained attorney. I, well, from my experience, I never hired highly trained, experienced bankruptcy attorneys, except for that one person who was going to make sure they, they laid eyes on every single case. But the person going to 341 hearings and things of that nature, they were, you know, two year, three year attorneys tops making 40 to $50,000 a year. I know that Francis Jackson, um, uh, Jack, as we call him, uh, from up in uh, the Northeast, he he has a veterans uh, benefits defense practice, and he hires attorneys all over the country, um, and they do have to appear at appearance hearings, but uh, he's getting, you know, he's paying forty, fifty thousand dollars a year. So those types of attorneys you can get at a lower rate. If I need, it, if I if I have a criminal law firm and I've got to hire somebody that can you know, deal with all sorts of different criminal based cases, um, that attorney's probably costing me 110 to 150, uh, depending on the market that they're in to be able to handle that kind of case. And so, but, but at the same time, when I get them at 110 or 150, I, I expect that they can do their job. Same with family law. If I, if I get a family law attorney who's going to bill 120 to 150 hours a month, and I expect to be able to drop them into the situation and work the case cases immediately with very little training other than the way that we, you know, the cow goes through the pasture and eats the grass at the firm, I expect them to come with needing very, very little legal training to be able to work their cases. And so um, those two litigation-based case types is something where I, I expect you can get what you pay for when it comes to lawyers. That's not to mean that it always happens that way. I've heard plenty of stories of people who are hiring really highly skilled attorneys who ended up to be a, and paid them a lot of money and ended up being a flop. Um, but more often than not, I find that to be the case. But so you you replace that one person. Where else are you now, David? A phone guy. And the phone guy on the day he resigned uh, gave me a replacement who I hired the next day. Well, that was nice of him. Yeah. So, I mean, he they, they'll work together during his last two weeks. She comes in. She'll be with him for four days. So that will help uh, train on the computer programs we use and the systems we use. So that'll be a help so that one worked okay it was a little more stressful for me because at the same time that happened i was trying to add another area of practice had an office renovation going on was trying to hire um, new staff people and then i had to backfill my core business so that just made it extra special yeah well and welcome to the game Right. I mean, that's uh, whether you call it Satan, whether you call it the world against us, the universe that karma, uh, Murphy's law, whatever title you want to give it, uh, it it shows up for a small business owner at the most challenging time, no doubt about it. And so we're you know, you that's why I always tell people you want to find out how good your systems are open another practice area, open up another office, whatever, because you are going to be tested. And that's what you found out you were being tested. So 
Um, but congratulations on maintaining, a, I think, a 78% higher rate through that whole process. So yes, sir. <laughs> uh, great job. Um, Joe Jepson, I see you had a, a comment there about the um, uh, about the subordinate. Let's talk about that a little bit. If it's an attorney, uh, what, what do you how do you differentiate this? Uh, Most of them heckling because that's what I do. But um, so I've always hired pretty uh, low on the food chain uh, and trained up. I, I you know, I've told you in the past, you know, we we hire people at a low rate. We throw in a broken pool, pool cue and see who comes out of the room. Right. Um, and it, it's worked, but I've always had a high turnover, uh, you know, attorneys usually last for right at one year. Um, and so I'm always in a training mode, uh, which is frustrating. So this last year I had a really good year. Uh, you may remember. Um, and the, I think so everybody had, remembers you. Won the yeah. Day you know, like well and endearing. Um, so I had some cash sitting, uh, sitting there. And so I invested in a, uh, a more experienced attorney. Um, she knew, state law on the adjoining state that I didn't really know that well. She spoke Spanish, like all these things that really checked the boxes. And she came in, just was not the right person. We didn't hire by core values. Uh, we just looked at how many boxes she checked. And, you know, we are hardworking hustlers and she wanted everything handed to her. And so it was just wrong person. Um, and so, um, you know, we replaced her with someone else where I was willing to pay more to get some experience. And that person also um, just is wrong, wrong, wrong culture. Um, so I'm kind of retrenching back to uh, the core values and what a, a good person for this firm is going to be because bankruptcy, like you just said, is not attorney driven practice. Um, it's a lot of, um, you know, simple or even complicated, but not really complex issues uh, and so it's easy to train and so we need someone that um, you know isn't coming in with expectations and bad habits um, and, and work from there so that's that's where I'm at on this yeah I agree I I think the, the, the key for me that you hit was this idea of core values uh, maybe didn't hire them the way you thought you should have so uh, and, and to give everybody who's a partners club member some insight inside baseball in November I've uh, Sherry's working on it, but I think we've nearly retained um, a EO, EOS uh, presenter to talk about the book, Get a Grip. Uh, inside Get a Grip, uh, that was written by Wickman, I believe, um, mm -hmm. he, he reveals this scoring guide that you need to use in order to um, for clearly identify what a uh, new employee will, will, how they will fit into your culture per se. And it's a mathematical formula to just, you know, apply a number as to where they think they fit. And they must be, you know, like a five in every category in order for you to hire them. And if they're not a five, you, you don't hire them. And so we're, we're going to get trained on that. If you don't want to wait for that, I highly recommend you grab the book, uh, Get a Grip by, by Wickman. Um, it, it, they give it step by step. It's likely one of the best uh, parable written books I've heard on this idea of traction. Traction is much more like a textbook, very dry, boring, and can easily get lost in the weeds. Uh, get a grip is telling the story of how a company actually puts this stuff into practice. And so um, I, I think that you'll, you'll find uh, success there. Uh, Michael said he loved that book. That's great. All right, let's, let's talk a, a little bit about, you know, this idea of um, hunting and fishing. So I think it's really important to recognize that, uh, finding good quality talent is just like marketing. So when you, in, in your world, well, no, you can. So in your world, you can both hunt and you can fish in, in most of your worlds, uh, you, you fish by having keywords as the bait in Google, Google Organic, Google Paid, Facebook, whatever. And you're using keywords to fish. And so the fish are swimming by and they see your keyword as a bait and they grab onto it because they're searching for that particular thing. So they're the right kind of fish and your bait was attractive to them and they latch on and they become a lead. You're fishing. You've dropped a line in the water with the bait of a keyword. Hunting is where you, you, you acquire a list and you vet that list somehow, and then you, 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 you go and you uh, hunt that list. And so that list can be hunted by direct mail. That list can be hunted by retargeting on Facebook. That list can be hunted um, by um, 
uh, you know, by doing it up on, on re a retargeting campaign through pay-per-click or TikTok or all these things that are opening up through social media. So what I suggest to you is that when we, when we recruit, we want to do the same thing. So phishing is like we're putting an ad on, on, on Indeed, on ZipRecruiter, on Craigslist. By the way, a lot of people forget about Craigslist. It's a, it's a pretty big deal. Um, there's still an awful lot of traffic on Craigslist. So don't ignore it. Um, but you, so that's, that's hunting, right? Or that's part of that's fishing, putting an ad out, having them come to you and reply. And, and, and oftentimes you get a lot of replies. And so it feels like it's enough. Uh, but the problem is, is that in, in tight labor markets, oftentimes the best possible recruits are not being, are not out there looking for a job because that's what the Indeeds and the Zip Recruiters and the Craigslists are looking for. So you, you want to make sure that you're also hunting. And so how do we hunt? Well, uh, places like LinkedIn, um, places like your existing employee network and giving a, starting a contest or referral bonus or whatever, if they send you uh, a lead, a prospect for somebody that you can employ, um, going out to job fairs. Uh, getting out of your house and your office and going out to eat, going and buying things or shopping so you can get out to the world and find those people you're looking for. Um, and then finding other pools to hunt in. So let me give you a quick story. So Michael and I were recruiting for the closing rooms done for you sales structure, and we needed to hire a couple of sales reps. And so I, you know, I, it, we we're hiring right in the thick of the great resignation. So we've put ads out and we're getting nothing, getting nothing. I mean, we're getting leads, but they're horrible. We had, you know, 255 applicants in, in the first day, but they were all junk and nobody would follow any directions. Nobody would follow any systems we did. And we tried everything and they were just junk. And then people would, you know, schedule an appointment and not show up. How many of you, you know, had people schedule an appointment for an interview and like no show, right? And then, like you said, you would actually like what you had to hear and you would make the pitch and they would be interested. And then they would like no show on the job day one. I mean, that everything of that nature happened to us. And then I decided I wanted to go hunting. And, and so I, we talked to Michael about it a little bit and, and we talked about using LinkedIn and how to go hunting on social media. And then I said, you know, I just want to get out there. And so uh, the, the same day I decided that, literally the same morning I decided that I had a tea time at uh, 1230 on a Friday. And so I was, I was going to my tea time and I was at the putting green and one of my buddies said, hey, did you meet my son? You know, so-and-so. And I'm like, uh, I'm like, no, I go, uh, hey, it's great to meet you. Yeah, he's in, just graduated from Clemson. And I'm like, oh, great. And finds out we're in the same foursome together. And so, you know, I did what I was taught to do, which was I don't ask the young man if he's looking for a job because that seems invasive. Um, what I did is during the course of the day, I said, hey, by the way, um, you know, I'm curious, do you know any of your buddies that graduated that don't have a job position placement yet? And he's like, yeah, as a matter of fact, I do. Why? I go, well, you know, we're, or you think they'd be any good at sales? Yeah, actually one of them might be really good. And, and, uh, and so I said, well, you know, uh, we're, we've got this company here, 30 second infomercial and gave him 30 second infomercial. He's like, oh, I think he might actually be interested. And that was it. And at the end, I texted him and said, hey, by the way, don't forget to send over your buddy's information. He sent over his buddy's information. By the way, he hired. I mean, he came to join our company and he's wonderful, wonderful. Now, he had to be trained from the ground up. And I mean, green, 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 like no sales experience whatsoever. And I think, I don't know, over the last couple of weeks, I think his close rate is somewhere between 67 and 75%. I could be wrong. Um, you know, so maybe higher, I'm, I'm making that up, but it's close. I know it's way above average. So, so this is a green person that had to be trained on a very, very specific skill set. And it took me and Michael about eight days of solid training to get him to where he was ready to get to the next stage. And I would say about two weeks of solid, like really kneecap to kneecap like training before he was on his own and able to do it without any problems. Now, we, we also found somebody else from recruiting. We, we actually went out to LinkedIn and we hunted on LinkedIn. And the way we found this next professional was by messaging people on LinkedIn who call themselves sales professional. And this guy 
happened to graduate from college with a degree in selling. I didn't even know that was a thing and didn't really have a job, but he put himself on LinkedIn as that profile. And so we recruited him again. He understood the art of selling, but didn't understand our process and had to learn from the very beginning. So he had to be coachable. So we got our two best recruits by hunting, not fishing. And so I, 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 in today's day and age, I think we have to fish. Okay. We have to have the ads out there and running. We have to have the hooks in the water. Uh, but, but in order to be successful, I do believe it's vital for you to hunt. I know that, uh, I think it's Jeff Meadows that was talking about, I think I wrote about him in one of the, the newsletters. Jeff was driving through a Chick-fil-A. I don't know if Jeff is here. I should see. I don't see him. Okay. So, uh, Jeff was in driving through a Chick-fil-A and, and he just happened to need somebody at his firm that I think it was a, I want to say it was a receptionist or intake specialist. And the person was just incredible when he went through the drive through and Jeff just said, Hey, have you ever considered, uh, you know, is this what you want to do the rest of your life? And they're like, no. And you know, have you ever considered working in a professional environment? I own a law firm. I'm, I'm recruiting and you sound amazing. I'd love to give you a chance. And they're like, Oh my gosh. And he recruited them right on Chick-fil-A. So Chick-fil-A gives them great customer service training and they had that. And then they had a great attitude and, he hired them and they've become a rock star employee for, for him. And so my point to you is in this day and age, we have to hunt. Anybody else have a great story about, um, uh, anybody else have a great story about hunting? Anybody want to share just either raise your hand or say, I do. So I can see who's saying it. Anybody else have been hunting lately and had a great experience? David. David. I yeah. heard, if I'm muted, I heard my, uh, sushi waitress as my marketing uh part-time marketing uh person she's getting her degree in marketing she's in her final year she is cheap and she loves it and i'm giving her experience and she's happy beyond belief and yeah, does all and my you're giving her media. real experience like real marketing experience cutting her teeth in a real way and she's happy to have it um my uh, Michael's girlfriend, Delaney, um, much to my chagrin, uh, is still working for an hourly wage much lower than I would expect that she's worth. However, the company that hired her, it was a small business out of, I think, out of Kansas City, Joe, um, a marketing company, and they hired her to teach her the ropes of marketing. She got a degree in marketing from college, and she took the job because, one, it was remote. And, and two, because they were going to give her the experience, to your point, David, they were going to give her the experience, back to the original quote that I read about Warren Buffett and Benjamin Graham, uh, and she was going to get that from them, and they did, and she's learned a whole bunch. And I've told her, by the way, she's an independent contractor with her own LLC, and I've told her to raise her rates, and I've told her that she should go out and get more clients at a higher rate, but, you know for her purposes, she doesn't need it. And she feels like she has a lot of loyalty to this company because they trained her really well on how to do this particular job. Don't underestimate that. So, you know, we're hearing a reoccurring theme, by the way, folks who are new coming out of college, that's a great pool to recruit from. Like college graduations just happened. There are a lot of people who are just a, haven't yet gotten, received jobs or took jobs that were lousy and they didn't like, and they're looking there's a lot of college graduates out there right now that are walking into this time when there's not as much recruiting going on at this very moment as there was, say, six months ago. Um, and, and so there, there is real opportunity for those new college grads that you can hire that can do a lot of these roles that don't require a license. Um, Anybody else? Luke, sort of combination of posted job in Indeed and a paralegal at a rival firm reached out to me via social media to explore the interest, just hired her. Yeah, Luke, I think that's a great example of, you know, ha so, you know, here you were, you were fishing. I would call that a fishing example, okay? So uh, that, that they reached out to you via social media because they knew you and had experience. And so here you were able to recruit them. Uh, but Luke, what, what, um, but that meant that you had to be on social media for them to even reach out to you. I mean, did you know them uh, like socially before, or did they just look out and find you on social media? Um, only that we'd sort of interacted, uh, over the years. Uh, this is a paralegal for one of the trustees. Yeah. And so, uh, you know, we were friendly just in emails. And so, you know, she wanted to see my kids pictures. I was like, ah, eh, friend me on Facebook, uh, you know? 
And so, you know, every once in a while, she'd message me something on Facebook. So I posted a thing on Indeed and she's like, well, I have to really, you know, very carefully exit my current job. Uh, and I was like, hey, you know, I know you're awesome. So meet with me, we'll figure it out. And, and you know, we, we had to orchestrate this very delicately, um, but we did and she just started this week. So super exciting. Good. I mean, at the end of the day, I think that, you know, so it's fishing, but it's also the fact that you're out there. Um, you know, I would be really bad at that. I, I got to be honest. I mean, if somebody tried to find me on social media, I'm there, but like, you know, my team looks at it, but I'm not there to interact and message with people. And I'm not building my network regularly through social media because I personally don't use it. I, personally, we use it for business all the time. So kudos to you for getting benefit out of social media. There are real benefits to be had in social media and making those connections. And so nice work uh, maintaining that relationship over a long time. And, and there you go. You, you had a job and you found out you got a winner out of it. So congrats to you. Um, and so Ken, Ken Shepard said he spoke to a chapter seven trustee in Canton and recommended her paralegal of five plus years. And she's still with you. So Ken, there you go. So you're out there networking, finding, letting people know you're looking for somebody to fill the role. And, and then, you know, it happens to be another tr trustee and they recommended their, her, their paralegal. Now, curious as to why they recommended their paralegal and why you thought, you know, they were going to work for you if they weren't working for them. Why, did, why were they willing to let somebody go? There's Ken there. Yeah. Um, well, this was years ago. And that particular trustee uh, just didn't have uh, in her private practice, as well as getting uh, cases, enough work. And she had another assistant, so she couldn't really afford the paralegal. She went a different route. So when she found out that I was looking for a paralegal for the new office at that time, she recommended her and it all worked out. Good. Good. I love it. So again, being out there, making sure you're in the community, having these conversations is super important to realize hunting is a vital part of this. Always be recruiting, always be recruiting. Now, by the way, it makes it a lot easier to recruit when you've got some celebrity status. So I was just listening to a podcast today, one of my favorite ones, and they were talking about how they're recruiting. And they're like, you know, ever since we launched this podcast and we're, you know, one of the top five growing podcasts in the country, we have so much traffic that when I need to fill a role, like I, I literally have lines of people saying they're waiting to work for me. And, and yeah, I mean, we have to sift through the trash, but you know, it, there's just really, really qualified individuals that are willing to jump through a bunch of hoops to, to come work for us because of our celebrity status and our traffic. And so becoming a celebrity in your local market really does help becoming a celebrity and making sure that your LinkedIn profile and your, so, your Facebook page and whatever other social media things you're using, as well as your, your uh, website uh, and making sure you have your authorship celebrity and your expert status in place really makes it a place that people want to work for you. And then, and then we've talked about this idea of, you know, if we're marketing for this type of individual, for me, not only do I want to try to attract the right person, I want to repel the wrong person. So, you know, if you go to the richardjames.com forward slash careers, I think it is my recruiting videos there. It's the same one. It's still at my old office. Uh, it's okay. It just tells the story uh, about who we are and, and we no longer recruit from an office. I probably need to shoot another one, but I, I haven't. So, um, but it works and it gets the job done and it kind of goes through our core values and it talks about who we are and who we're not. And, and it's designed to repel the wrong person and attract the right person. And I, I insist everybody watches that before, we, before they get on a call with me. And, and if I do get on a call with them, um, they, they, uh, I, I test them to see if they've watched it. But by the way, as an FYI, we did the same thing when we recruited for the closing room. I had Michael go ahead and shoot one of those videos and tell them what the closing room was all about to try to get clarity about who we are, what we stood for, what our core values were. And, and, and that went a long way to hiring the two people that we hired uh, because they were, because it was a startup, there was a question mark there, right? Can we, can they do this? By the way, just to be clear, these, these folks took, you know, hundred percent commission jobs uh, with, in a startup situation. So over whatever other offers they had out there. So either that's telling us there's not a lot of other offers out there 
maybe it's telling us the candidates weren't great, but I'm telling you that they were. They graduated from big time schools with great GPAs and all that other stuff. Um, but I think it had something to do with the fact of how we positioned ourselves. We became attractive to the right person. Um, and then let's talk about, let's talk about like, how do you retain them? So one of the things I want you to know is for me, I needed to get with the times, right? So for years, I, I fought this idea of unlimited time off and, and, uh, uh, and I fought like, you know, I, I, I've told you all the story and it's worth repeating, but remember I, I had a lot of smokers in my one company and, and I had, you know, dozens and dozens of employees and I would watch them all, all the phone room, they would truck out, you know, every so many minutes and they would go get their smoke and, and I would then, you know, get aggravated because they weren't on the phone and I recognized it was so many dials. And so I decided to run the math and I put together an Excel spreadsheet and I showed of how many minutes I clocked them. So I timed the timer, how long they were out there. And then I found out, okay, based on that much time, they could make X number of phone calls, times the number of people, times the number of connections, times the number of sale rate, close rate that we have, times the number of average case value. Well, for us, it was customer value. And, and, and what they were actually costing us and then fundamentally what they were costing them in commissions. And so, you know, I equated it to that, you know, that that pack of smokes instead of costing them, whatever it was, $4 and 50 cents at that time was actually costing them $14 and 90 cents because of their loss of commission. I wasn't really popular. I mean, I, th I thought this was going to be a good idea, but it didn't make me a popular individual. It just made it true. Um, and, and, I wasn't all that happy and they weren't all that happy. And, and so now, uh, you know, fast forward to today, um, I don't tell any of my team when they have to work. Uh, you know, they're, if they're driven by appointment because, you know, they've got appointments or they're driven by call times, then, you know, they've got it. They're driven by the macroeconomics of things, but I'm not telling them where they have to be, when they have to be there. I'm not tracking their time. I'm not, I have no interest in it. I'm not asking them to give me time sheets. I, I used to, add, you know, even as of a couple of years ago, I asked for like a daily done sheet and I wanted to know what they were doing. And I don't do any of that anymore. I, I have no interest. I, what, I, what I'm interested in is what are their key metrics that I'm watching? Um, is the job getting done? Uh, do they do it right? Uh, do they raise up problems? Do they follow our core values? Are they serving our clients well, depending on what their role is? And, you know, do we have results based on what their job is that they do? Um, and, you know, how does that measure up with the overall profitability of the firm and all the macros that are happening with my pay scales and my gross revenues and everything else? And so, you know, maybe I'm partly this way because I've been able to systematize to the point where profitability is where I want it to be. So I'm a little less worried about it. Um, but, but, but I actually think it's the opposite. Um, I actually think I'm more profitable today because I haven't been as much of a stickler as I was in the past. Like I was trained the way that you got the most profit out of a business was you squeezed everybody as tight as you possibly could to get as much juice out of the lemon. That's how I was raised um, in business. And, and, I, and I think that was wrong. I just saw Elon Musk put a post out there what a few couple months ago or whatever it was about how, you know, this idea of working remotely and not working 40 hours a week is for, for the birds. And if you're not working 40 hours a week, you know, you're not, you don't want to work a 40 hour a week job, you shouldn't be here. And, and I suspect that's because of the masses that he employs. There's probably an awful lot of people that, um, you know, that are, that are taking advantage of the system and we're working remotely and they're having more than one job. And there's a lot of that crap going on. And I'm sure that crap does happen. But in a larger company, and I'm sure it happens in a smaller company too, but I, I don't know, if, if you're in a small business and, and your job, the job is getting done the way you want it to get done, when you want it to get done, the right way, uh, you got accountable people who are showing up you know, at, at the meeting times when they're supposed to be there, ready to, ready to go, and they serve your client well, they close deals, they set appointments, they get the legal work done, whatever it is. Um, I, I just don't know if we should be as sticklers about this. And so one of the ways I think we get our staff to stay, I believe, is by creating a much looser environment by which they work and just try to find the right people to work in this environment. By the way, if you've got the wrong people, they won't work real well. And, 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 the, and the people who think you should have, especially if they're from old school, people who think you should have the people who you know, show up at you know, an hour early and stay an hour late just for the sake of being there, um, and they get upset with the people who are there for six hours a day but get the same amount of work done because they're not there the same amount of time, they're not gonna work in this environment. 
And so, yeah, you have to make sure you've got the right people doing the right jobs and you've got to watch them and you've got to set your metrics. Um, I, I used to think, well, geez, if somebody could get, you know, 10 things done in six hours, surely they could get 12 things done in eight hours. Like that's how I thought was, but I don't, I don't find that to be true. I find that, that sometimes they actually get five and a half things done in eight hours because of Parkinson's law, right? That law that states that you will get accomplish your goal in the time that which you set yourself to accomplish it. And I, I just think, you know, out of spite or just resentment or burnout or whatever, when you try to keep squeezing everything to the edges, um, your staff starts to burn out. And so uh, unlimited time off and, and flex work schedules is something that I've employed over the last few years. And it's worked wonders. Uh, and we have blackout dates. They can't take, they can't take vacation during the events and they, they can't take vacation, um, you know, together if they're on the same team. I don't want them to take vacation at the same time. So one team member can't, there's, there's nobody to cover that role. And, and they're responsible for making sure their job is covered. And even if that's me, that's got to cover them. They're responsible to make sure their time isn't matching with my time off. And so, you know, we have to work through those things, but really I, I never ask them how much time they're taking or when they're taking it. The other thing I would tell you is, you know, how often do you write them handwritten notes and what way do you make them feel like you care? And, and how often do you just stop and say, listen, I just want you to know if I haven't said it in a while, I appreciate you. You know, I think you're a rock star at what you do. And, and I, I, you know, I just think you're awesome and you can't lie. You can't make that stuff up. You, you actually got to believe that, but how often do you stop and say that to somebody? And, and how often do you make them feel special by writing a note? You know, like mine happen at least every quarter. Um, they get notes from me um, at, at, after every event. It's a marker for me. So, so my team gets notes from me about thanking them, um, it, you know, and, and so, and then, and then in what other way are you giving them personal buy-in rather than, rather than just saying, you know, hey, hey, uh, we've got this new idea and we're going to implement it. And this is what we're going to do, whether you like it or not. Um, you know, how, how, how often do you feel like, you shove things down their throat and just tell them this is going to way it's going to happen rather than, you know, actually getting their buy-in from the way it has to get done. Like we're running this brand new marketing campaign. There's a lot of moving parts. I mean, a lot of moving parts. And, and, you know, my past nature was to be just shove it down their throat, shove it down their throat, shove it down their throat. You know, you take it and run it. Here's what I want you to do. Here's a detail. Listen, I still do some of that because I'm kind of a detailed guy, but I've said, well, what do you think we should do? And well, how do you think we should get it? And how do we go about it? And okay, well, here's a budget, go get it done. And it's amazing. It's showing up, right? And it's getting done and we're, it's moving forward. And maybe it's not moving as fast as I might've moved, moved it as a, if I drove really hard, but it's moving and it's moving at a reasonable pace and I'm, and I'm happy about it. And, and so, you know, I, I don't know. I just much more laid back. Maybe it's the Scranton in me moving to the West coast. I don't know. But, but I, I will tell you that the Scranton in me was not, was just not all that happy <laughs> coming to work and hated managing people and wasn't as profitable. And I, while I don't like managing anybody, I, I love my team and they seem to like working here and everybody feels good about it. And, and they all know that if any of them want to open up their own business someday and learn how to do it. I'd be happy to help them any way I could. So I don't know. I, I just... I just think, uh, you, you know, you've got, you've got to think more about that. So some of you got to run. I know we're a minute over. I'm, I'm on vacation time here, so I'm giving you a little bit more. Um, I, I would finish with this. Um, two, two things. One, uh, as you're thinking about, uh, as in these more difficult times, another idea for you, um, in, in addition to recruiting from college graduates and, and making sure you're hunting, big one, is this. Make sure you try to outsource as many administrative tasks as you can. So take all of the work that everybody does and ask yourself, okay, what if this is administrative that we could take off their plate and have like a, a VA that can do all of this administrative work? The question is, can I create more capacity for the staff that I already have? And the way that you do that is you, you list all their tasks and you say, okay, here's the administrative things. And you give those tasks to somebody else. We're doing that internally right now. We hired another person and we're taking some of the things off other people's laps and we're giving that to them to create more capacity for the higher level staff. And so we're using the you know, outsourced VAs or whatever people in other countries that are at a lower cost and we're having them do some of the administrative work. And so by going through your existing employees uh, task list and identifying, and that's back to using the management tool we've talked about in the past, not enough time to unpack that here, but identifying what they do, figuring out which is administrative, and outsourcing that to a VA, we're finding to we're able to create capacity.
for existing staff and they get to do more of the stuff they like to do and less of the stuff they don't like to do anyway. Uh, the other thing is centralized customer service. Many of you have your staff really bogged down by the phones um, and, and they're, they're reactive to when the phones ring. I will tell you that the phones are the number one distractive tool to centralize all of your phone calls to a person or a team, depending on how many phone calls you have would be the number one way to build capacity for your team. Get the phone off everybody else's desk. There is no phone, like unless they have to for some other reason, but they just, the phone doesn't need to be a tool in, in this particular scenario, especially when we have Zoom the way we have it now. We don't have to bother somebody in a reactive way where we have phone. Also the same thing like Slack and all these other communication tools where we're just constantly bombarding people with messages and they feel like because they're on, they have to, re they have to respond. Give people time to work in time blocks and actually get their meaningful work done. Find a way to get rid of all of that crap. The, the more distractions you can get off their desk and let them work in actual meaningful time blocks, the more capacity they have and the more work they're going to get done. That's a way to create more capacity. That's the way to, way to retain more staff. It's creating a much better working environment. Well, finally, I'll just tell you that figuring all this out is the reason why uh, you have the ability to get paid at, if your company is profitable at a good level. And the reason why you can have the, pro the, the freedom to take a July and December off, if that's what you should choose. It's my decision to do that. And you may be, may be yours, it may not be yours, but whatever it is for you, uh, have the freedom to do what it is you want to do when you want to do it. And, and we are paid in, in large part to be able to put up with more crap and the willingness to pick up, you know, turds with our bare fingers and everybody else is. And so I, I just suggest to you that this is why we are paid what we're paid. The ability to put together these systems, hire the brightest and the best, uh, and give them a system they can work in in which they feel like they belong and they will stay. They're paid a market-based wage. They like what they do and they're willing to learn how to master their careers. And so we talked about a lot of that today. We had some inter, inter conversations with all of you. If you're new around here and you want to learn more about us, by all means, go ahead and, and email us or, you know, visit the richardjames.com forward slash, well, just the richardjames.com. Go ahead and watch some of the videos or grab a free copy of the book or schedule your consultation with us or watch our masterclass that we put together. And um, you know, if you, if you feel like you're ready and it's right for you and it's something that you want to do, uh, we'd love to talk to you and have that conversation to see if the timing is right and see if we can take the first step and date before we get married. But for everybody else that's been here today, that I hope that I brought you some value. Hope we had a good conversation. As always, it's been my pleasure. Uh, for some of you, I will see you in August uh, at the Partners Club event between now and then. Uh, lots on my schedule, golf, golf, and more golf. That's not me rubbing it in. It's just me letting you know what's possible. Remember, I had a life where I had no life before, and now I have a life, and I want you to have that life too. So let me know how I can be of service. It's been an honor and a pleasure to be here today. Enjoy the day, everybody.